Libya, because it had such a weakened state identity because of geography, uh, required a, 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 an extreme dose of authoritarianism to hold it together, whereby Tunisia, by comparison, or Egypt, by comparison, required much milder doses of authoritarianism to hold it together. And when the, and when the Libyan dictatorial state collapsed, nothing replaced it. Uh, the problem in Tunisia is politics. The problem in Egypt is politics. Building a consensus among Islamists, radical Islamists, some secularists, some liberals, etc. But the problem in Libya is governance itself. That the elected government's writ cannot project its bureaucratic power beyond the capital city. Uh, the American embassy was attacked in Benghazi by Al-Qaeda. That's because there were Al-Qaeda training camps nearby. There were Al-Qaeda training camps nearby because the Libyan state does not exist outside of greater Tripoli. And again, here's a case where geography is not determinant, it's not fatalistic, it just provides a deeper understanding to what we read in the news. Um, then there's Yemen which, again, another age-old cluster of civilization, but because divided infernally by various mountain ranges, was always home to not one uh, dynasty, but six or seven at the same time. And so the Yemeni state was always weak because of its rugged geography. The British and the Turks, who, who, who nominally ruled it, were never able to penetrate into the interior uh, very deeply. So when the, when the dictatorial state collapsed in Yemen, uh, Yemen became relatively ungovernable, almost impossible to travel through from one part of the country to another. Syria, another vague geographical expression of ethnic and sectarian groups rooted in regions um, uh, which, whose central government was so distracted by sectarianism and ethnic divides throughout the Cold War decades that in order to build a state, it had to appeal to, to radical pan-Arabism. So, so that the Syrian state was the throbbing heart of anti-Zionist Arabism precisely because of the internal weaknesses driven by geography within the Syrian state itself. Um, in other words, um, it's not just who you are, it's where you live that helps determine your, uh, y you know, your political personality. I write in the book that even more than the system of government, it's a country's place on a map that helps define it. Look at my country, the United States. Americans believe they're <coughs> special people, they're exceptional people. But on the other hand, America just happened to be the last resource-rich part of the temperate zone uh, that, was, uh, in ha that was settled by Europeans at the time of the Enlightenment. America is also a place rich in natural resources that has more inland waterways flowing in a convenient east-west uh, 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 east -west direction <coughs> than all the waterways in the rest of the world combined. So that it was a vast continent protected by oceans and by the Canadian Arctic to the north that nevertheless was easy to connect within inside itself because of these internal waterways, the Missouri and Mississippi River systems. Uh, so that America's only real threat is with Mexico Mexican demography to the south, which I'll mention a little bit later on. So these things, too, made America an exceptional country um, in, in the 20th century. Take Europe. You read about Europe, and all you read about is debt ratios, and you know, it's on the economics pages. If you don't know about spreadsheets and, and this and that, you can't fathom what the heck is going on in Europe. Uh, between the Portuguese debt crisis and the Greek debt crisis and this, well, a lot of it is rooted in geography. Take, take the great cities of the European Union. 
Maastricht, the treaty town, Strasbourg, the headquarters of the European Parliament, The Hague, the European justice system, uh, Brussels, the European Union itself. Um, these, this is the old spinal route of civilization of Charlemagne's empire in the ninth century. This is ninth century Carolinian Europe. It's no accident that the most well-developed, wealthiest, prosperous area of Europe is in the spinal route that goes from the North Sea south to the Alps, uh, containing all the rich, lost soil that allowed for free farming and allowed in later stages of technological development, movable type, for instance, uh, the development of free societies. But then you had other Europes. You had Prussian Europe. You had Habsburg Europe uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Central Europe. You had the Balkans. The Balkans were riven by mountain ranges, settled by the Byzantines and the Turks, a much weaker, in terms of institutions and economics, a much weaker standard of development than that which obtained in the Habsburg lands or in the Prussian lands or certainly in the post-Charlemagne part of Europe. Then you had Mediterranean Europe in the south, Italy, Spain, where you had weaker, stonier soils, which had to be, which, could, which required irrigation and therefore were friendlier to autocracy. It's not an accident that the most troubled country in the European Union is Greece, which lies at the confluence of Byzantine and Turkish Europe and, and Mediterranean Europe. Three quarters of Greek businesses are family owned with family employees where meritocracy does not apply. This is not just the result of the mistake of this or that finance minister. Uh, this, is, this is more, it's deeper. Uh, it goes into the fact that Greece is the child of Byzantine and Turkish despotism because of geography and always had a much more weaker institutionalized state where political parties up through the 1980s were really chieftaincies with very little uh, bureaucratic support, uh, you know, organized around coffee house chieftains where family dynasties played an especially big role. Um, whether that of Mitsutakis or Papandreou or others you can name. Um, therefore, so the European Union, the Eurozone, is a very ambitious undertaking. It's ambitious because it attempts to unite vast regions that have had vastly different development patterns under one single currency. And therefore, it's experiencing trouble, uh, significant trouble. That, you know, that regions and nationalism are still important. Um, let's go to Russia, for instance. Uh, in, in the United States, at least, the media loves to hate Vladimir Putin. Um, they consider Putin a thug. He rides on a horse without a shirt on. Um, he wears leather jackets. He's tied in with Russian crime. He's immoral in his position on Syria or Eastern Europe or the Baltic states. Vladimir Putin is, is just a normal Russian autocrat like the czars and the commissars before him. He looks out at the world from the geo, 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 geographical compass point of Moscow and Russia. And what does he see? A country that encompasses half the longitudes of the earth but which has a smaller population than Bangladesh, has no natural borders, has been invaded not just by Napoleon and Hitler, but by Lithuanians, Poles, and Swedes throughout history. And therefore, he requires a buffer zone in Eastern Europe. So while the Warsaw Pact may have collapsed, he will do everything in his power, from establishing crime groups to helping fix elections, uh, to manipulating prices of natural gas and the building of pipelines to reestablish some sort of buffer zone in the Warsaw Pact countries. The same goes with the Caucasus, where he needs a buffer zone to protect Russia from the chaos of the <coughs> Middle East. He requires more bandwidth in former Soviet Central Asia, again, because he's afraid of Muslim fundamentalism there. Uh, Putin's geography is the same of that of any Democrat who may succeed him in future years or decades. The West seems angry at him because guess what? He's not a Westerner. He's Russian. Um, um, 
And because he's Russian, he has a specific geographical focus, which by definition is going to bring him into conflict with the West and other places that have different geographical focuses. Um, let's look at China for a moment. China has both a positive geography and a negative claustrophobic geography. Its positive geography is here's 1.3 billion people with 100 million people alone up tucked in the northwest in Manchuria. Though just over the border in the Russian Far East where there's so much timber, diamonds, and gold, and uranium, there's only 7 million people, and the population is declining to 5 million. So China has great possibilities to expand its corporation, its, corpora its corporate control, its, its population into the Russian Far East. Uh, China is, um, it, you know, is building oil and natural gas pipelines throughout former Soviet Central Asia. It's building railroads throughout former Soviet Central Asia. It's mining for copper in Afghanistan. It's recreating the Tang Dynasty of the ninth century with trade routes extending into northeastern Iran. Um, the Americans want desperately to leave Afghanistan. The Chinese desperately want to stay and come in in even bigger numbers to exploit the strategic minerals and the strategic metals that lie underneath it. Um, uh, similar in Southeast Asia, where the, the strong state bulwarks of Vietnam and Thailand are weakening. Vietnam because of economic problems. Thailand because of internal domestic political unrest. And so China applies a divide and conquer strategy. But that's the good side in terms of Chinese demography. The bad side is ethnic Han China exists in the center of the country in the coastal periphery. All within the borders of China itself, in the, in the, in the drier plateau uplands, from Inner Mongolia of going over to the west to uh, Xinjiang province to Tibet in the southwest, you have minorities, non-Han minorities. Inner Mongolians in the north, Muslim Turkic Uyghurs in the west, Tibetans to the south. And it's in these upland minority areas, within the Chinese borders themselves, where most of the water resources for the country lie, where 80% of the coal lies, where, where much else in terms of mineral and natural resources exist. Um, so that China can both see beyond its borders to create a great Eurasian geopolitical power, and on the other hand, it feels claustrophobic because any political opening in China, any liberalization that must take place eventually is going to lead also in terms of this, in, in addition to the striving for individual rights, it's going to lead to the striving for ethnic minority rights and identity. And so while China sees itself dominating the former Soviet Central Asia and the Russian Far East, it sees itself losing Tibet at the same time to some sort of autonomy. So it's this geographical tension which will drive the destiny of China in the years and decades to head, ahead. And remember, China, as you know, is building a great navy and air force. It's contesting territory, territory in the maritime periphery in the South China Sea and the East Sea. But what allows China ultimately to go to sea in the manner that it has is because its land borders have been relatively more secure in recent decades than at any point in Chinese history going back to the High Qing Dynasty at the beginning of the 19th century. And if these land borders become more unstable because there's minority unrest in a liberalizing China, that may impinge on the Chinese leadership's ability to press its claims in, in, in the Western Pacific in the maritime sphere. Um, uh, a, wor a word about India. Uh, America, Australia can leave Afghanistan, wash their hands of it. India can never leave because Afghanistan is part of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, if you go back to all the dynasties in Indian history, uh, Maurin, Nanda, Gupta, Mughal, etc., uh, what you'll find is that 
New Delhi controlled most of Afghanistan, all of what is today Pakistan, and the northern third of what is today India, the Ganges River Valley. So a a non-pro-Pakistani, non-anti-Indian Afghanistan is something the Indians require. And as the U.S. leaves uh, Afghanistan and the U.S. becomes less and less relevant to the political bargaining in Afghanistan, you will see India draw closer to Russia uh, and and try to stabilize its relations with China in order to prepare for a um, post-American, post-NATO, post-ally Afghanistan. Um, Iran. Iran, the the Iranian state may may, uh, undergo upheaval. Uh, its economy may collapse. Uh, Anything is possible except for one thing, the end of an Iranian state. There will always be an an Iranian state because the Iranian state is synonymous with the Iranian plateau. The Saudi state is not synonymous with with the Arabian Peninsula. Syria is not synonymous with anything, uh, the Syrian state. The Libyan state doesn't exist. There will always be an Iran for the West to deal with. And because there will always be an Iran to deal with, with great cultural bandwidth that extends from the Mediterranean to Bangladesh, remember Persia, uh, Persian language was the official language of India up until 1835. Um, Because of that, the United States and Iran are destined to have a rapprochement at some point in the future. The U.S. has been estranged from Iran for 33 years, a third of a century. That's uh, that's 10 years longer than it was estranged from quote unquote red China. Um, So some sort of accommodation must lie in the future because Iran is eternal because of geography in a way that many Arab states are not. Uh, Finally, let me deal with my own country, the United States, in a minute or two. Why did the United States become a great power? It became a great power because it came to dominate the greater Caribbean. Um, The New World is not divided between North and South America. It's divided between north of the Amazonian jungle and south of the Amazonian jungle. That's the real impenetrable barrier, because ships could go back and forth throughout the Caribbean. Uh, Venezuela, Colombia, the Guyanas may technically lie in South America, but their whole demography and population is oriented towards the Caribbean. Um, So by gaining control of the greater Caribbean basin from European powers in the late 19th century, the United States came to dominate the Western Hemisphere. And by coming to dominate the Western Hemisphere, it had power to spare to affect the balance of power in the Eastern Hemisphere. And that gave us the history of the 20th century, America being the pivotal power in two world wars and the Cold War after in the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, now, so as I said, America's only threat at the moment, geographical, is Mexico to the south. Mexico has a younger population. It's growing faster. Mexico is going to be one of the world's 12 largest economies pretty soon. Much of Mexico is also controlled by drug cartels at the same time. Uh, Latin history is demographically moving north. Uh, the, The kind of state that ultimately emerges in Mexico over the next 20 or 30 years will have a greater impact on the nature of American society than anything that happens in Iraq or Afghanistan or many other places. Um, And China, as it happens, sees the South China Sea as their Caribbean. Uh, 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 They've actually spoken about this. The part, you know, the marginal sea, like the Caribbean, that they need to come to dominate to become a great Eurasian power, more more than just a regional power. And finally, finally, technology, instant communications uh, do not negate geography. They just make geography more precious and interrelated and claustrophobic. They make every place strategic because every place interacts with every other place to a degree that it never did. So the way to understand the earth, the political earth in the 21st century is to go back to basics 
back, back to the map. Thank you very much. That was uh, dizzyingly expansive. Uh, I don't know where to start, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Um, can I ask you to wait for the microphone, uh, give us your name, and make sure your question is short, because I'm sure there'll be lots of interest. Up the back to start with. Thanks very much. Hi, Robert. Good communication. It's far too brief. I would love to spend five hours chatting with you, uh, just asking a uh, random question. You don't feel that the withdrawal of States from Afghanistan, etc., and the instability there will, will reignite. Um, look, everyone has been writing about how Afghanistan is going to fall into chaos once the U.S., the Australians, the Brits, and the others leave. Uh, they've been writing that the U.S. Marines are very well and are fine and impressive in creating townships throughout southern Afghanistan, but they're not townships, they're moon colonies. That'll disappear the moment that the Marines leave. Um, I'm not so sure. The reason I'm not so sure is that the Taliban now have calculators that have a lot of zeros on them. And they can see how much money they're likely to make from mineral exploitation. And the very fact that, so, that the Chinese and others want in to Afghanistan to exploit the mineral wealth provides a basis for an, for, 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 for an accommodation, uh, a, a compromise of sorts between the various Afghan factions, between Pakistan, et cetera, to allow enough stability to allow for the exploitation of these minerals. Um, that's the positive scenario. Um, the negative scenario is that uh, Afghanistan falls apart as a state and um, with, with very bad consequences, not for the United States or Australia, but for Russia, for Pakistan, for India. Because remember, the US fought for a decade and a half to keep Vietnam divided between a North and a South. But it failed. Vietnam became united. But that did not inconvenience the United States. It inconvenienced China. Because then suddenly China had a, 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 a Vietnamese mega super state that it had to deal with. You know, in other words, a very ironic result to a lost war. You could have a similarly ironic result to a lost war in Afghanistan, where the United States loses, but it doesn't suffer. And the places that suffer are all the peripheral countries around it, from Iran to Russia to Pakistan. I'm still correctly you said that Iran will, uh, America will have to come to some sort of you know, uh, compromise um, with Iran. So I'm um, interested in your views on um, the Iranian scheme of nuclear power, um, what America might do, what Israel might do if they do see Iran as a long <clears throat> uh, There are increasing indications that the Iranians are suffering severely from economic sanctions, that it's destabilizing the regime, and that the regime has openly talked about an accommodation with the West on uranium enrichment, uh, which might happen after the US presidential election when it's clear who the Iranians will have to deal with. Um, so I'm not given up, I haven't given up on the possibility of a peaceful arrangement that, you know, that avoids even a reason to attack Iran. Um, I think that what really frightens the Israelis and the Americans regarding a nuclear Iran is not the, the fact that Iran may actually drop a, a nuclear weapon on Tel Aviv, because uh, that would lead to the end of the Iranian government uh, because of retaliation. I think what really terrifies the Israelis and the Americans is that an Iran with a dozen or so nukes changes the whole regional political equation so that every crisis in Lebanon between Israel and Hezbollah, every crisis in Gaza between <coughs> Israel and Hamas suddenly is freighted with much worse implications. 
Uh, it, re it reduces the maneuver room of the Israelis in terms of responding to crises in Lebanon and Gaza and elsewhere. That's, I think, what really terrifies Jerusalem and Washington. Um, I think that it's, you know, Iran may, may decide to have the capacity to enrich uranium, but never actually going through with it, but always maintaining the capacity to do so. It may, it may opt for having all the requirements for weaponization, but never actually going through with it. So as to gain the political prestige of having a nuclear capability without incurring a, a, um, a, a military strike against it. Thank you, Robert. Richard Bernowski, University of Sydney. What are two efforts? Thank you. It's interesting of you to say that, uh, that the Western Pacific is China's Caribbean. And given the inevitability of geographical history, you must also probably say that they're going to take it back, too. My question, though, relates to Mexico. I spent three years there as Australian ambassador in the 90s. And I must say, I found. Sorry, Richard, your question? There and since, a tremendous. Pessimism about its institutional capacity, yeah. its ruggedness to survive. What do you, why do you say it's going to work for 12 weeks? Uh, right. Why are you yeah, uh, well, because it's already about the 14th or 15th. Uh, the economy grew by 4% last year, which is very impressive for a developed economy to grow that much in the teeth of a global recession. The U.S. economy only grew by about 1%. A lot of other Western economies had similar, like, no growth, um, uh, no growth results. Um, also, the coming to power of uh, President-elect Nieto in just less than a month's time uh, has precipitated a range of deal-making between Mexican political parties that seems to give some hope for more institutionalization. Uh, the worry I have is that when, if you look at, if you accept the fact that what is government? Government is something that monopolizes the use of force in a given geographical space. Uh, so that you can't just go and kill someone because the government will prosecute you. You know, there's a leviathan on top. If that's how you define government, uh, well, then you have to say about a half or a third of Mexico is outside the control of the government because you have the Sinaloa cartel in the west, you have the Los Zetos in the east, can, you know, essentially being the government. Um, um, in, and, and you also see that Mexico City is losing control of the northern third of Mexico uh, to these cartels. So, and yes, violent, remember, we've, there's been 55,000 deaths in the drug wars in Mexico since 2006. Think of that. Uh, you know, that's not as great as Iraq after the U.S. invaded, but it's twice as much as Syria, almost three times as much as Syria. Now, the deaths have gone down somewhat, rather dramatically in the past few months, but that's because the big cartels are consolidating their control and, and basically uh, imposing a piece of sort of sorts without the, the without the uh, without uh, the Mexican government there, so it's not that I'm optimistic. It's that I see different trends going in different directions in Mexico, and I'm not sure how it's going to eventually turn out. Right down the front. There are some people here. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> All right, Australia. All right, Australia is a big continent, but with relatively few people, with 22 million people, uh, island continental nation, uh, separated by seas from other places, so that Australia is needs to be allied with the world's greatest maritime power or, the, or the, the region's greatest maritime power, especially if that maritime power happens by accident to be Anglo-Saxon as well. Um, at this, and for the last few decades, Australia's had a, a benevolent situation. It's had a rising Chinese economy, which makes Australia richer because Australia trades with China. Um, especially the Perth region, etc. 
cetera. On the, and at the same time, it's had a unipolarity at sea because of the US Navy and Air Force. So Australia's uh, uh, security was protected by, the, U, by the, U, the US military while it could get rich trading with China. Um, that situation won't last forever. Because uh, as China gets wealthier and wealthier, um, it becomes a power in its own right. So I think given Australia's situation, it needs to hold America close at its, as its preeminent ally. But it also has to make sure that the United States does not needlessly antagonize China. That the United States, while seeking to prevent China from dominating the South China Sea, does not let uh, the Philippines and Vietnam, for instance, drag the US into a war with China over the South China Sea, or even a military incident or two. It's a matter of keeping your best ally honest um, by constant consultations and saying, don't go too far with this, because we are in the region. We have to get along with everyone. Um, Israel and the, and the Palestinians is really a zero-sum demographic game in a sense. Um, the birth rates, the population growth rates of West Bank Arabs, Gaza Arabs, and Israeli Arabs are all, in each case, several times that of, Israel, uh, uh, of Israeli citizens. So that um, Israel cannot forever control all the territories it controls without becoming some version of an apartheid-like state. Um, on the other hand, Israel would say, well, that's all fine and good, but who are we supposed to negotiate with? Uh, the Palestinian leadership is divided. Uh, Palestinian politicians are insecure, looking over their shoulder. None of them you know, have the political will for a sustained, meaningful gesture that would force us to make concessions. So what are we supposed to do? Um, I think what's likely over the near and middle term, looking ahead five, 10 years, is we may get an Israeli unilateral strategic withdrawal from significant parts of the West Bank while annexing other significant parts. You know, making sure the high, the high Arab population regions like Jenin, Hebron, and Nablus are given up. Um, and that the Jerusalem corridor is fleshed out, the, Jor the Jordan Valley is fleshed out and partially annexed. Uh, um, that will give um, Israel significant demographic breathing space while also providing for some strategic depth. But it won't change Israel's fundamental problem of, of, of actually you know, coming to a peaceful uh, political accommodation with the Arab societies around it. It gets worse, because Jordan is changing as a state. Uh, the king is being forced into more and more uh, political accommodations with the Muslim Brotherhood, with the Salafists. The Arab Spring, you, you know, Americans, Westerners love to say, well, we're in favor of the Arab Spring. We're in favor of more democracy. I'll say, well, no, you're not exactly. You're in favor of it in some places, but not in other places. You don't want to see King Abdullah in Jordan overthrown or weakened in any sense, because he constitutes the most pro west Western regime you're likely to get. The same holds for Oman. The same holds for Saudi Arabia. I say about Saudi Arabia, uh, fine, the royal family is medieval and reactionary. Show me a, a more liberal group of people in the country that are organized and ready to take power and rule in a responsible manner. Um, you won't find it. Um, so I think that uh, Israel can solve some of its problems. Uh, but on its own, but it cannot solve its, uh, uh, more of its problems on its own. Right off the bat. Uh, Richard Hughes. Robert, thank you. Uh, how do you see the impact of uh, the growing number of young men between the ages of 15 and 35 and later, et cetera, and driven, coming particularly from China because of the imbalance in the, the birth rate from Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, probably from the 
had a student at the Naval Academy when I taught there to do a term paper on this very thing. It, she confined her studies to China. And her result was that the impact of more males in a society, particularly if they're unemployed or semi-employed, leads to more nationalism. Um, leads, to, le leads to more nationalistic, truculent, militaristic elements, and it also leads to the government seeking to act in a more nationalistic fashion uh, um, in this regard. So I think in China it's going to lead to more nationalism, especially as the party itself undergoes change and the military itself, as a result, gains greater autonomy. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's such a vast region, different things are going on. Uh, you have the authentic growth of a middle class in many places. You also have the weakening of states like Nigeria uh, in other places, uh, uh, you know, upheaval in Mali and other places. But because this demographic youth bulge is going to take hold over the next 10 or 15 years before it subsides, as well as Africa does economically, and it is doing well, 6% growth rate in the last year, that's pretty good. It's still going to face a lot of internal upheavals. We've got time for one last question. Um, Claire Pollard, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about Libya. Um, how would you, like, if you could redraw it, what would you do with that situation? You can't redraw the map. Yeah, I, I yeah. Know. yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean the, you mean the, 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 uh, the military action to no, topple the regime? Like, if, you have, if you have an area stuck between Tunisia and Egypt, yeah. like, like, what could be a better solution? I'm not sure there is one. Don't assume that every problem has a solution. You know, that's the story of international affairs. You know, that gets me back to the beginning in Voltaire, that there's a solution to everything. You know, but I'm saying you operate under a geographic and other constraints. And I think the West has no choice now but to try to increase the governing capacity of the, go of the regime in Tripoli. Before I thank Robert, um, Firstly, you've all been very kind by not asking him to uh, stake it all by calling the US election. <laughs> yeah. um, next week, we have Jatinda Mann uh, from the King's College in London speaking to us about the history of Australian foreign defence policy since 1914. And a reminder that on the 13th of November, we have the annual Lowy Lecture keynote this year being delivered by Cameron Klein of NAB. And tickets for both of those events are available on our website. Um, but please join me in thanking Robert Kaplan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.